Give me some of those so it looks like I'm doing something. That's fine, that's fine. I'm with you. Oh, nice, nice. We're live streaming. <laughs> So the problem with that, my well, situation. Like, oh, do we want to do that right now? Well, no, we should do it at least. Say like, thank you for coming. I don't know. All right, I'll go tell Andy. All right.
served in the army. And I don't know if he did tag or what to become to go off. Yeah. Like a chance to talk. So I was looking into it about going to tag or apply applied for the army and then they said you know boss. Might as well if I can get some else to take it. But I would have yeah. yeah. He's trolling. 
know he's trolling at this point. Well, he worked for the Obama administration for how long he's been. Yeah, before he got fired, he worked for the Staff of the International Relations Club, 
and the Young Americans for Freedom. But in the spirit of free speech, we are going to be handing out note cards, which you can write your question down on and then have it asked. One of my colleagues will pick it up, so please just pass it down to the side of the aisle. We'll accommodate as many as possible, but we might not get to all of them. One thing I do need to know, and I have to thank the press for being here, this is not a press event. This is for the Ripon College community, faculty, staff, and students. Now, when the Q&A section begins, I would like all of the cameras to be turned off and turned around for the purpose of not having audio or video recording during the Q&A section. Now, to introduce Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. He has over 33 years of military service, and he, this culminated in the, him as the Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, making him the nation's highest serving military officer. His experience is broad, and his expertise is range far beyond normal natural intelligence. They go to counterintelligence, national security, and cyber operations. He serves as the principal advisor to Act for America, AFA, a nonprofit, nonpartisan, grassroots national security organization with over 300,000 members. General Flynn's first book, The Field of Fight, How We Can Win the Global War Against Radical Islam and Its Allies, is a New York Times, USA Today, Washington Post, Ingram, Amazon, and our Barnes and Noble bestseller. <sighs> and now, without further ado, please help me welcome uh, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. Thank you. up here a couple times with uh, President-elect Trump for various uh, campaign events. I was up here to, to meet my friend Mike Gallagher, who uh, just won. So, I mean, that's a good feeling, isn't it? <laughs> and, you know, I, I will use Mike, uh, because I had asked about him if he was going to make it up here, as an example. And some of the things that I believe our country uh, has to... Um, start to think about, and that's, and that's service beyond what we do as young people, you know, whether it's in the military or in politics or in community or in, in, uh, in business or whatever, but, but how do we think about serving, serving our country? And, uh, and I will tell you, for, for, uh, for this uh, state and for our country, that we, we probably have one of the leading figures that most people, you know, people are going to be, when he shows up to Washington, D.C. and, and uh, steps into Congress, I mean, unbelievable. A couple of years ago, talking about stuff, and I mean, when he shows up in, in there, he's going to take it over. He's going to take it over because it's the type of person, when we think about the skill set to serve, I've been, I have been, uh, since I've gotten out of the military, I have gone around the country to encourage our veterans to, at the, at the local, state, and federal level, to, to make a decision to go back into service to nation politically. Politically, because we really need, you know, when we say, you know, how many, how many of our, of our uh, members of the House or how many of our senators have served in the armed forces, you know, it's a very, very small percentage. It's not necessarily a reflection of, of the country. And so, you know, I believe strongly that we have to have more and more veterans serving in our, at, at the federal level in our, in our legislative branch, because I think it's so important. Because when we decide uh, that the nation, the nation's in this state of, you know, just perpetual conflict, uh, when we make those kinds of decisions and we try to figure out what it is that we're going to do, uh, it would be nice to have people that have actually, you know, sort of been there, done that, and served. So when we're making those tough decisions, that we're making them with people who actually uh, understand what it is, because those are really, really unbelievably difficult decisions. And we're, we have an entire, we have a plate of those for the next administration. So, so first of all, um, I really want to say thank you very much for allowing me the privilege and the opportunity to come up here and, and talk really to 
to young people because um, I think it's the, the youth of our country that needs to feel empowered to feel like I felt when I was uh, going through college, when I was a young kid, trying to figure out what I was going to do, and, and now I'm standing here, never in my wildest imagination would I, would I have ever believed that I would be involved in what I'm involved in today. And you know, there's, a, there's an old phrase, you know, he, he who dares wins. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to dare, you have to risk things, you have to take a risk because you believe passionately in the, in, in the country. You know, the idea, the idea of patriotism is not lost. I'm, I'm from the state of Rhode Island. I'm one of nine children. Uh, my, my, uh, both my parents are deceased now, but my father was World War II and Korean War veteran. My, both of my grandfathers were both in World War I. And, uh, and one of my grandfathers was in World War II, and uh, you know both in, in, you know a lot of my, two of my grandfathers, my father were, were enlisted, you know sergeants or, or chiefs in the navy, and uh, and they taught us you know they taught us to serve, they taught us about service and, and service to country, but the idea of patriotism is is not a dead it's not a dead thing. We want it we want to have patriots in our country. The part of the, the, uh, the country that I'm from is up in the New England area, and I've been up on Lexington Common and studied our earliest days of this country when it, when it, was, uh, when it began. You know, the, the, the men at that time that ran out of a, basically a, a church to, because they were told, hey, you know, the British are coming down the street here, and I've actually been on that street, had a, I, I drove down it in a bus with a bunch of other international officers that I took to Lexington Common. And I formed them up on Lexington Common. And then we went through the whole sort of description of, of, uh, of that particular first battle when people stood their ground against, against essentially tyranny at the time. And then they fell back to uh, an old, a place you know, called the North Bridge. And, and I went and we walked the North Bridge and we walked through the terrain there. And we stood on the other side of the bridge, and it's a little creek, it's a little tiny creek. You think of these things in history, you know, in a historical context, you think they're these big places. It's this little tiny place, it's no bigger than this hall, with a little creek in the middle and a little bridge. And the and the, at that time the militia, our our uh, forefathers are you know, they formed up in a in a sort of a box in a square. And when you hear the phrase that you know the shot heard around the world. And that was, the, that was standing there, and they still don't really know. The real story is they really don't know who actually fired the first shot. They just, there's an individual who they've identified, and they think fired the first shot, but, but they fired that shot against a much greater uh, sized force at that time. The British force, which was very well organized, they had cannons, and they had, you know, they were in the, in the trees on the other side. And when they fired that, you know, it just, it like, it surprised them. It surprised our patriots, the patriots that stood their ground against all odds, and they won. They won the day. They pushed the the uh, the British uh, back off of the ground that they held at that time, and that started really our whole Revolutionary War. It really, you know, and, and so when you think about that era of our country, that that historical period of our country. And there's probably some historians in here you know, that know a heck of a lot more than I do. You know, when you think about what you study in a place like this, in a great institution like this, and I did a little, you know, study in a, of uh, your history. And, I mean, you look at the date on the front of this podium up here, 1851. You know, so our our country continues to grow, and we continue to stretch our muscles, and we continue to figure out who we are as a nation. And we continue to think about what is it that we want to be? How is it that we want to be as a country going forward? And I will tell you that uh, this, this particular campaign that we just went through, it was very, it was, it was uh, like warfare at times. I, I, it was many times when I said, God, I would much rather be fighting Al-Qaeda in Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> We just, we just experienced a revolution in this country, a political revolution in this country. We really did. I think when all the, when the dust begins to settle, it hasn't really settled yet. 
but when the dust settles and, and people begin to really study what happened and we start to think about you know, who we are as a nation because the country, the country made a decision. The people of this country decided. And the people of this country are really, really smart. There's an old, an old book that somebody gave me one time. You know, it's, a, it's a kind of a neat book. It's called Wisdom of the Crowd. But the, the idea that, that the, the United States of America and the, and the people of this country were not fooled by anything. And they made a decision. We made a decision. Our country is not built to protect the government. Our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, is not about the federal government. It's not about the government. It's about individual rights and individual freedoms. The ability for individuals to make a conscious decision about what it is that you want to do as an individual. You know, and all the rights that we have, you know, to bear arms, to freedom, to uh, peaceably assemble, practice religion, honestly, I mean, all the kinds of things that, we, that we're able to do. It's, it's a country that's built to protect individual rights. And we, we have, and, you, and there's so many, as I, as I went through this, and as a, as a real amateur, and, you know, sort of historian in our own, in our own uh, country's history, you know, you go around, particularly when, when, uh, when uh, living in, in the D.C. area, Washington, D.C. area, I go into some of the monuments of some of our old, you know, our first presidents, or some of the sort of the great leaders that we had, you read some of their quotes, and it's fascinating to, to see some of those because what they talk about is they talk about all the different things that we must protect and we must be careful of, you know, and they and all of them. I mean, all of sort of our founding fathers, you know, they, and they didn't get it right, they didn't get it perfect, and they did the best job that they could with our Constitution. They did the best job that they could at the time. But it wasn't perfect. I mean, I think there's been like 27 amendments to our Constitution over, over our history. So they didn't get it perfect at that, at that moment in time. But when you, when you study some of these individuals, and then when you begin to study our, our presidents and other leaders that we had in our government, certainly in the first 100 years, you begin to see, you know, they began to, to recognize that, that too much government imposition into, our, into the lives of a of a country that was built on individual liberties, it begins to become a problem. And we're feeling that right now. We're feeling that right now. I mean, we're not just in, in our own, uh, in this, the, the size of the federal government, the size of the, of, the, uh, of the bureaucracy that we have. I mean, we've seen it, you know, double, triple, quadruple in some cases, based on where, you know, which, which particular government bureaucracy you wanna, you wanna, you know, to God. So we have that happening in our country right now. And I think that there's a, there was a, a huge reaction to it. Because it is, this is not about, you know, the, the, those who want to serve for other purposes other than you, other than us. We want servants who believe in self, in, in, uh, in selflessness, in that idea of selfless service, a higher calling. Because you know it's the whole it's the whole issue of you know of, of uh, and this is gonna this is gonna play out in, as we go forward, uh, particularly with this administration is this idea of of uh, term limits, term limits in, in government. You know because people that stay in government too long, you know you begin to look at them, you kind of you, they they lose touch with the common person in our country. They lose sight of what it is that we have. You know and then, and then there's a you know, the whole argument about, you know, the, the uh, popular vote versus the electoral college. Well, that's our system. And if you do just a little bit of, you know, just Google search on the electoral college, when we had the, the, the first 13 original colonies, we had about 4 million people at the time in our country. And there were small states, like the state I mentioned that I'm from, Rhode Island. And there was large states, like the state of, of uh, New York, in terms of population. There was a couple other places. Philadelphia was another place. And they would have, they would have, had they only gone with the popular vote, those places would have dominated the original colonies. And they would have dominated our, our political system. Instead, 
what they made decisions on at the time was to give some type of equal voice as much as they could through this thing they call the Electoral College to some of the smaller states. I mean, we have states around this country. I mean, Montana, big, beautiful state. It's got about as many people as the state of Rhode Island. So now, you know, when we pay attention to the Electoral College and how, and how that shapes our lives, because it's really important, because it, keep, it comes up, for, you know, for all those that have paid very close attention to this, it comes up every single presidential election, you know, especially when, they're, when there's, you know, the, the business with, uh, with the popular vote. It comes up every single one. I know it came up in the 2000 election as well between uh, Gore and uh, Bush, and it came up in this one. And, but the, but the Electoral College, again, designed, designed at the very beginning of our country. And so, very important. So for the young people, you know, for the students that are attending this great institution, and you begin to study, you begin to think about what it is that, that we are about, what you want to be about. You know, the, the idea of statecraft, the idea of national security, the idea of our armed forces and what are they supposed to be doing? The idea of international relations and international affairs and diplomacy and the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about because the world looks to the United States still for leadership, still. And when we experience a deficit of leadership in our country, the world feels it. They feel it. And that deficit of leadership causes reverberations all over the place, because uh, tyranny and, and, and totalitarianism will always, always fill a vacuum that's a, a void that's left. It will always be there, because, because evil exists, it just exists. It's human nature, it's human behavior. Okay, the population of the planet, population of the planet has tripled, has tripled in, in roughly 60 years. Roughly 60 years. So we've had People walking on the planet for thousands of years, it's tripled from 1950 to 2010, and there'll be another, another um, census done in 2020 here. I mean, we're, we've gone from a couple of billion to maybe 2.3, 2.4 billion, I think, in 1950 when we counted the people on the planet post World War II, and now we're up, I think we're, we've crested 7 billion. So, and when we think about the middle of the century, we're looking at maybe 10 billion people on the planet, most of which will be in two countries, India and China. So when we begin to think about the role of the United States of America, when we think about the security and the safety of the people of our country, when we think about governing, we, we really, really have to stop. I mean, most people, most people, uh, most kids, and especially, I, I'm sorry I call you kids, but young adults that are attending our college today, you don't even know what you're going to do Saturday night. You know? I mean, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it's Thanksgiving coming up, so maybe people will, will be uh, going out of here to go back home to spend, you know, some very quality time with family, and I hope everybody does, and I wish you a happy Thanksgiving to everybody in the room, to you and your families. But we don't, we tend, and as Americans, we tend to be very short-sighted we tend to be very short-sighted, and our country tends to be very short-sighted. A, a great example of, of strategic, of a strategic view was, again, post-World War II, when we, when we had the National Security Act at that time, where we said, and it was classified, it's not classified any longer, but essentially, essentially that National Security Act said, we will defeat communism wherever it re rears its ugly head. Okay? That's, that was essentially what that document said. And so for the students in here that are studying this, this field, you know, go, go back and, and dig that up and ask your, your professors to, ask, to allow you to maybe write a paper on it to begin to understand what, what we need to do as we go forward in the, in the rest of this century, certainly the first half of it, and we're already into the second decade of the 21st century. So that, that particular National Security Act, that went through a whole bunch of presidents, so presidents from different parties, all the way up until the, essentially the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. Because that's essentially what, what that act was created to do, was to defeat communism. Because we saw communism rise 
after we defeated Nazism and imperialism. Okay? So now, now we're into this, this, this you know, the second era of something. Something is happening around the world. Big shift. You know, it, it, for many in this room that, that I, as I look around and sort of trying to gauge the, the age group that's in here, you know, it was kind of an east-west world. You know, maybe we're not an east-west world anymore. I don't believe we are. We're in a, we're in a sort of a more of a north-south, if you want to just be, you know, put generalities to it, where we're facing a different type of, of threat. We're facing different challenges. We are facing nations, nation states that are definitely rising and they're moving rapidly in many cases, but you know, and really I'm talking about China now, but maybe there's a, maybe there's an economic bubble that may, that may explode that we don't see, or we can't quite tell just yet. You know, we, we, and it's hard, it's very hard to tell, because you look at, at how China may be uh, dumping certain commodities on the market, or manipulating currency on the market, on the global market. And we've allowed certain things to occur. We've allowed China to enter the, the sort of the monetary market. That's a big deal when we did that. It's a big deal when we did that. There was a long, long fight to, you know, a diplomatic fight to, to, uh, to uh, uh, finally admit them. And you now we have to now understand, well, what does that mean? So there's, so there's sort of a, a currency war. One of the things that's to our benefit for those of you right here up in this part of the country, one of the things that's to our benefit is this essentially the, the currency of choice, the currency of choice around the world economically is the US dollar. That's the currency of choice. The language of choice for commercial activities around the world essentially is English, is our language, okay? So what we wanna do, and that's, that, that, that gives us an advantage, that gives us a strategic advantage. When we think about the, the money that we are exchanging around the world, when we think about the language that's being used to, to do business around the world, countries, nation states, and there's a couple of books that, in fact, for the, for the uh, students here, you know, study. If, you, if you're going to understand national security, if you're going to understand international relations, if you're going to understand political science, study why nation states fail. Study why they fail. One of the big reasons why they fail is not because their militaries were necessarily defeated. Many cases, and, and if, you know, there's a couple of, of indicators that you can that you can understand. And those are things like their economies began to collapse. Their economies began to become overstretched. When you when you look at their militaries, particularly some of these older empires, you see a military that was way overstretched and didn't have the resources that it needed to be able to, to sort of contain and sustain the empires that existed. That's why we use words like, that's Byzantine when we're talking about something old, right? You have all these different empires. You haven't met, a, you haven't met a, somebody from the Roman Empire lately, right? <laughs> right? I mean, because, so when we talk about sustaining our country, and I've said this about this election, this election is not about four years. This election has to be much, much different than that. This election has to be about the next 40 or the next 400. Somewhere in between, we've got to figure out what our strategy needs to be, what our sort of grand strategy needs to be as we go forward in the rest of this century. And I became very passionate about this when I became a grandfather. And I have, I have a couple of grandchildren. I don't know how many in here have grandchildren. But I, I became very passionate about this because I'm holding my, my, my youngest grandchild, my granddaughter, up one day, and I'm looking at her, and I'm retired, I was, you know, fairly recent, recently retired, I've had one of these kind of philosophical discussions, and I'm looking at her, and my mother had just passed away. My mother lived till she was uh, the age of 90. My mother had a great life. And I'm looking at my, my uh, granddaughter, and I'm thinking, geez, by the time she's my mother's age, her great grandmother, she she will have she will be in the next century, the next century, not this one, not the 21st century. She'll be in the 22nd century. In fact, she, in fact, she won't even be my mother's age by the turn of the next century. She lives to be even being close to her age. She'll only be 87 by the time the next century comes around. 
So as I'm standing there holding my granddaughter, this is for you students, but for anybody that's in that age category that, that looks and aspires to you know, grow up and, and, and have life experiences and, and have a family and, and you know, be involved in our nation, when you begin to look at something, something like that from that perspective, for me personally, this became very personal, that, that was my vision. Because as I look, there's one thing that I understand is I understand the threats and the challenges that our nation faces. Because there are many. There are many. You know, all this business about the rise of radical Islamism, I got it. I got it. I, I know that. I know that problem. A, resurg a resurging Russia. I mean, it's, you know, they, they are reinvigorating. Russia is reinvigorating. And many, you know, for many reasons, we have sort of enabled that. We have enabled that. China, I talked a little bit about China. You've got a country like North Korea. So when I first came into the, into the military, you know, I studied uh, Kim Il-sung and then Kim Jong-il. Kim Il-sung was the guy that sort of created what's called the chooch after the Korean War. He was the sort of the, he was the, you know, the god in North Korea, still is. Then his son took over from him. And if I was to describe that in any, in any sort of practical way, I would say those two, they're both dead now, those two were rational actors. They were rational. Uh, they, they, they were totalitarian, but they were rational. We now have the son, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un, who is uh, who's now in charge of North Korea, who I would not describe as a rational actor. I wouldn't describe him as a rational actor. And, and he continues to develop a nuclear capability. So we, we can't, you know, you have a nuclear capability. Well, imagine if you're South Korea or Japan, you're concerned about that. Never mind what is happening in the South China Sea or the growth of the Chinese military. So these are, these are all of the sort of the geopolitical, you know, things that we are dealing with in our country, in our country. Now, so, what, so where does that take us? Because, because you know, as we, as we go through this transition, and I will tell you that um, the hardest thing, the hardest thing in warfare, the hardest thing in warfare, it's not fighting an enemy. It's not fighting an enemy. It's transitioning. It's transitions. It's, you know, I got a new unit coming in, and I got, a, I got an old unit going out. And when you do a transition, when you are going to transition on the battlefield, when somebody is going to come and occupy the fighting positions that you have, going to occupy the area of operations, when you're going through that transition, you know, the guys and gals that are there now, they want to get the heck out of there as fast as they can, you know, make sure that everybody survives. The people that are coming in are, are incredibly anxious. You can, you, can, you can smell and see the fear because they're coming in and they know it's a dangerous area. It's transitions. Because there's a, it's a time of uncertainty. It's a time of uncertainty. We are in that process right now strategically for our country. We're going through a transition. You know, and you, and you listen to the, you know, to the mainstream media, you know, or the media in general, and you don't know what to believe. You know, you look at all this stuff, it's like, God, it's like just constant, constant barrage of negativity. Constant barrage of negativity. I mean, God. I mean, I. You know. I mean, I. I don't mind being called all sorts of things. I, you know, you got to have a thick skin in this business. But, uh, you know, but it's it's just it's just the way it is. And and so you have to understand it. But we are in a time of great great uncertainty right now, globally, and our country's going through a change of leadership. Change, you know, the entire sort of government, if you will, will uh, will change will change up, the leadership will change up, and it's going to be different. It's going to be different. And so we'll be okay. I mean, the way I always tell people, just sort of stay steady. You know, we're going to be just fine because we have great Americans who are in the organizations that we have today that are ready to continue to sort of what we call continuity of government, continuity of government. So we're going to be okay. Our country's going to be okay. But we are going to then springboard from where we are today forward, uh, for, for where we want to be, not in the summer of 2017, or, or you know, to try to 
begin to plan, you know, for the next political election of the of the next president of the United States, which I, you know, I've already heard people in some of the conversations on that. And I'm like, wait a second. Let's focus on what, what we want our country to be before you start worrying about politically, you know, what you want to be politically. That's a problem in our country. It's a problem in our country because we have created something that our, our founding fathers did not necessarily want to create was a political class in our in our society, in our culture. And, and we, we have to recognize that in ourselves. And I think that that political class has uh, not, you know, there's, it's not that everybody's bad that it's in politics, but it's, there's, there is a political class that has been created and it wasn't necessarily something that, that we wanted from the beginning. I mean, we have now that this first, it's the first for our country. We have an individual who never <coughs> ran for any kind of political office ever, who is now the president elect of our country. And that's a good thing. I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it just shows how smart the American people are. How smart they are. Because they decided, the American people said, this is not working. This is not cutting it. And we need to bring some, some sense of sort of stability, steadiness, back to our country. Leadership, back to our country. And it's not because of you know, the, the previous administration, because I'm not a political person at all. I always joke and say that last time I was involved in politics was in high school. You know, because it's like, it's just not something that I ever wanted to do. But here I am today. Here I am today in this, in this uh, unbelievably, you know, like privileged position, and I take this this responsibility. I mean, it's unbelievable to me. It's a, it's amazing. So when we look at, at at what we want to do, we have to recognize that this is not about a person who you know desperately wants to be president of the United States or desperately wants to be a member of the House or a senator because of because it's a political thing that I want to do. This is somebody who says. I love this country. I don't see it going in the, in, the, in the direction that I believe it should go, and I want to get involved. I'm going to get involved, and I'm going to try to help do something about it. I'm going to try to make a difference. If there was two things, and this is mainly sort of back to the back to the students, back to the, to the university, or to the to uh, this great institution. Two things that I learned. And, I, and this is both back to, to my parents. Two things that I learned. Number one was the golden rule. Treat others like you like to be treated. The old adages of, of you know, by the time you're 10 years old, you learn how to say, yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir, thank you, please, at others. Because of, because of they're, a, they're a lesser class or they're in this class. I mean, the labels, the labels that we put on, on ourselves conservatives and liberals and Democrats and Republicans. I mean, uh, you know, we have to start to begin to see ourselves. That there's, there's ideologies out there, there's ideas, and we have to challenge each other, you know, we have to challenge each other on them. And you learn that, you learn that in class, you learn that in the institutions like this, because it's about laying out the facts, developing your assumptions, you know, I mean, the, the hypotheses and the, and the idea of an argument and going and doing your research, that doesn't stop when you graduate from college. If so for all those that, that, young, that great young man who's up here introducing me, he said he's an unbelievable talent. I mean, it doesn't stop. It's constant. I mean, that's all they've been doing for the last four days is studying, studying, studying. And recognize, and you learn to recognize. I was talking to a couple of young young students in the in the back room over here. Great, I mean, great mature young people um, about recognizing your weaknesses. Okay? Recognizing your weaknesses. Th these are things that I learned from my fathers. So I'm going to tell you in a second. I learned from my mother. It's super important. Recognize your weaknesses. I have counseled. Thousands of people, thousands over my career in the military, you know, formally, informally, or council of thousands. And you know, when you a question I would typically ask if I was going up and talking to somebody, or formally or informally, I'd, 
you know, you, you generally knew the person, and you'd say, well, why don't you, you know, talk, tell me a little bit about, you know, your, your strengths and your weaknesses. Inevitably, inevitably, they would always start with their strengths. They would always start with their strengths. The best, the best that I, that I have worked around, the best that I've worked around would always start with their weaknesses. Because they recognized in themselves that they had things that they, that they weren't prepared to do or they weren't really strong at, they weren't really good at. They knew what their strengths were. And they knew, they, 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 you know, they, in some cases they were innate or they were, they were developed through experience or training. You really have to think about what your weaknesses are because if you don't understand your weaknesses, then you, you're going to fail. You're going to fail more than, you, more than you think. And if you understand your weaknesses, then what you can do is you can shore those weaknesses up. You can shore those weaknesses up. And I have many, many. And so how do I shore those weaknesses up? You can try to surround yourself with really good people. Or you work, you, you work 10 times harder than anybody else. You read more. You study, you ask questions, you listen, all of these things. So on, on, from my mother, my mother graduated from law school at the age of 69. Remember, I'm one of nine children. So she went and got, she raised us, she was a valedictorian, salutatorian from her high school class, and, and thank God she married my father, Charlie. <laughs> Otherwise, she'd have been off doing something else as a, as a young lady during, a, during the era of World War II. But she, you know, I mean, she pounded into us learning. Be lifelong learners. So for the young people, you know, you get your college degree and, you, and you, you, you're crashing into the world now. You want to do nothing but get a job and start to, you know, and be, and be great at whatever it is. Everybody in this room, there's a lot of, you know, there's probably a lot of faculty here certainly parents and, and others here, or just or people from the community. Never, ever, she instilled it in this, never stop learning. Because once you do, you're dead. You're, you're done. You're probably dead. Never stop learning. Be a lifelong learner. That's a big message for me tonight. Because I learned something uh, in myself. Because I'm going to tell you, many, many times, many times, I questioned, what the heck was I doing? You know, what the heck was I doing? Because you get assaulted, you get attacked, you get berated, and you begin to feel like, oh, my, you, know, you begin to question yourself. You begin to question your judgment. You begin to let fear take over. Even intellectually, even intellectually, we want, we want our military, especially our young people, we want our, our young military uh, men and women that, that we're going to potentially put into common, we want them to be fearless, physically courageous. As you, as you sort of go on in your lives, and it's something that I learned, I learned this, I learned this in, my, in my career, but I really, really, it really hit me hard in the last year. And that's this idea about intellectual courage. And recognizing that, that fear will sink in and you'll begin to question everything that you're doing. Is this right? Is my judgment correct? Am I doing the right thing? And you say to yourself, what do I believe in? Okay? And for me, it's, you know, it's, and I'll, t I'll tell you, it's, it's praying and it's doing all the things that I, that I, uh, that I uh, did. But it's also recognizing and saying, you know what, every time if I learn anything, particularly in the military, I trust my instincts, I trust my judgment, and whenever I did, whenever I, I felt something on the back of my neck, because that's a, that's a part of our DNA, that's in us, that's in all of us, and I made a decision in the opposite direction, I said, ah, no, okay, I asked, and something then bad happened, I'd go back to myself and I'd say, I should have trusted my judgment. I should have trusted. I felt that instinct, and I made the wrong decision. And I think that for the young people, 
but for all of us. I think everybody in this room recognizes what I'm talking about because of, you want to be able to be fearless in what it is that you believe in. Your values, the principles that you believe in. Whether it's principles that guide you in your community, in your churches, whatever, whatever your activities are, whether it's the values and principles that are, that are here in this institution, or whether it's the values and principles that you see in, in how our country and how uh, our nation should be going forward. We have to think about the future, and we have to stop thinking uh, in the short term. Because, you know, as, as one of our great presidents said, you know, we're sort of always one generation away from basically going away, from, from collapse maybe. And we have to make sure that as we think about what, where our country will be, what our country will do in the future, we have to make sure that we govern accordingly to the values and the principles that we, uh, that we know to be true. And we should not fear what our country was built upon. Our country was built upon a set of Judeo-Christian principles and values based on our Constitution, based on the Bill of Rights, based on the, I think it's 27 amendments that we've had since then. And, and we, you know, we will continue to grow as a country and as a people uh, here with the leadership that we have. Whether, again, whether it's at the community level, at the state level, or at the federal level. And we have to work together. Definitely have to work together. Two final points. We have a strategic advantage in this country like no other country on the planet. And that strategic advantage is something called the rule of law. The rule of law. And when the rule of law in this country is under assault, and it's not protected, and protected by, you know, by our first sort of line of defense, which is our law enforcement professionals, then, then we, can, we begin to feel a sense of anarchy. And we can't have that in our country. The rule of law above all other nations on the planet, and I've been on six continents and I've studied this world, Nobody, nobody in the world has the rule of law system that we have. I mean, we have a Supreme Court justice, right? Yeah, two of them, two of them here tonight, and from your state. I mean, the rule of law is something that we have to protect. We have to protect it, and it has to be. It has to be fair. It has to be fair for all, for everybody, for everybody, no matter what, you know, who you are, no matter who you are. And then, the, and then the last point has to do with credibility and integrity. Credibility and integrity. All right, you, and this is really for the, for the young students that are here, but I think that, I think that this you know, is for all of us here, uh, but particularly for young people, particularly for young people, because you're gonna, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna have, you're gonna do stupid things, and uh, believe me, you know, smart people do stupid things all the time, even when they become, you know, uh, uh, older and, and, uh, and, and sort of uh, older adults. But the idea of credibility and integrity, you have integrity in you. Nobody gives you integrity. You have to develop, you have to, you know, this is what you believe in, this is how you're going to act, and this is how you're going to be. So that's, that's your personal integrity. You know, it's your, it's your honesty or it's your passion for something. But integrity is something that nobody's going to give it to you. Nobody's going to give it to you. What is given to you is credibility. When you try to pat yourself on the back, that's not, that's not credibility. Credibility is when you do things. You serve your community. You do well as a student. You, you know, you, you, you're great on the, on the athletic fields, or you serve in your community. You know, you, you basically, you're good to other people. You help others. You help others, whether it's helping in service to government or helping in service to community. So then people begin to give you credibility. And you build that credibility up. You want to have people giving you credibility. And, and the more credibility that you get, that's, good, that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have credibility in, the, in whatever it is that you're doing, whatever it is that you're performing. And so you have to, in order, in order to get that credibility, you have to maintain your integrity. You have to maintain, maintain your integrity. Don't lose your integrity. Don't lose your integrity. Because when you begin to lose it, you begin to lose your credibility and, 
And then, you know, then it's, it's, it's not a good place to be. It's not a good place to be. So, you know, my, my big message here is that we are about to endeavor on an entirely sort of new approach. And it's back to, you know, the way, the way that the country kind of decided to be was a little bit into the center and a little bit to the right. Not on the, on the far reaches of our, of our sort of political ideologies that exist. The country did that. Not two candidates, the country. The American people decided this is where we want to be. And they fought for it. They fought for it. They fought for it politically. Not like our forefathers did, like I was describing with the shot heard around the world where they had to fight for it you know, against, the, against British tyranny. And that's a good thing. That's a real strength of our country. The world watched it. And I'm telling you that there's a, there is a level of excitement that we show. We show an example to the rest of the world of, of how this stuff can actually get done, how, how it can be done peaceably and, you know, e even, even with all the, the kind of the conditions that we're seeing on, around the streets, although things are starting to settle down a little bit, except for these, these incidents where, with, uh, where we're seeing our law enforcement professionals assassinated. Can't have that. Can't have that. So we're, we're endeavoring on, a, on, a, on an approach that the, that the American public has decided we're going to take. And we must, all of us that are in these positions of responsibility, we have to continue to listen to the American public to keep us on a track that we need to be on. And we can't think about, you know, what we're going to do Saturday night. We have to think about what we're, what's good for this country for the next, not just the next four, but the next 40. Much, we have to think much longer, much more strategic, and bring the best that we can together to be able to help us get there. So I would just offer to the, again, to the, my last comment to the young people is, Get involved, you know? I mean, get involved, stay involved. Local, state, community, or federal level, in, in whatever walk of life that you're gonna get, in, get into, you have an enormously, you have a, a superb foundation right here from this institution. You know, you'll go off and continue to get other, other degrees and educated and you know, be the lifelong learners that this place has really set you up to do. And your, hopefully your, your family system uh, has, has and continues to encourage you to do. And for me personally, it's a, it's a real honor to be here tonight. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm excited about, about what I'm going to be involved in here. Uh, I, I, I do not take uh, it for, for granted. I don't, I don't take it lightly. And I, and I have uh, really started to think about my weaknesses as I begin to step into the role that I'm about to step into so I can make sure that I shore up those weaknesses to help this country. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and God bless America.